Hi, my name is Stephen Batish, and I manage the Applied Sciences Group here at Microsoft. A few months ago, Dave, Dame, and I were hanging out in this lab having a regular one-on-one, -on -one, and we were just talking about HCI, artificial intelligence, and accessibility, and how all these things are coming together. And I was just so inspired by the conversation. I mean, Dave was literally spouting wisdom left and right. You know, he had full of aphorisms. And I was like, I got to bring in Bill Buxton to this conversation. You know, Bill's a pioneer in HCI, an amazing individual. And in fact, like I thought, why not just also record them at the same time? And so that's what we did. And, uh, you know, we, we sat down, uh, us three, and we talked about all these things, HCI, artificial intelligence, accessibility, past, present, and future. And, uh, and it was an amazing conversation. I was inspired by it. I hope you will too. Here's Bill. He's going to introduce himself. Kick us off. Thanks. Um, and so, uh, again, thanks for join, joining us. Bill, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. I'm Bill Buxton. I'm a lapse musician. I've spent 20 years as a musician, a performer, and that actually led to what I do in HCI and, and design. Namely, I think about it as a luthier, an, art, an instrument builder, and uh, bring the qualities of a in beautiful instrument to what we use every day with our computers and other tools. Uh, you know, one of the things I really love about interaction technology um, is that it is really a mashup of multiple fields together. It is not one specific field. It's foundationally based in, in the arts and the sciences and almost all the sciences and all the engineering disciplines. And all of those things really need to come together in order to produce a instrument in which you can effectively interact and, and do uh, an, an, an instrument, a tool to effectively essentially accomplish what you need to do. And this multidisciplinary nature about it is, um, is what has attracted me to the field itself. I myself have always been excited about um, all the various fields and even in school studied all the way from neuroscience to electrical engineering to computer science. Um, and, uh, and I think beautifully um, in applied sciences, in the applied sciences group, we've carried, carried that forward uh, where, you know, where it's not just we have a bunch of people together under one umbrella that are different fields, but we intentionally and purposely, our processes and how we think about things, try to solve a problem by combining these different fields together. You know, to me, the innovations aren't necessarily within the fields, they're in between the fields. Um, and that's what's exciting uh, essentially about it. And combining the, the fields allow us to draw tools and ideas that are seemingly potentially uh, uh, well known in one area, but quite revolutionary in another. Um, um, any thoughts there, Bill? I mean, because I, I know you, you've, you've someone that uh, you know has done uh, uh, similar things in, in, in your, your work today and as well as in the past. But first, I, I think um, the one comment that the word used was ecological and and. It is a larger ecosystem with all the complexities of interactions that fall in there that are is is most important to understand uh, to approach the topic. So first, there's a psychologist named Jean Piaget as a developmental psychologist, and he defines intelligence. And this comes to this issue of machine intelligence. Um, he defines intelligent as the ability of an organism to adapt to a changing environment through the dual a process of accommodation and assimilation. So adaptation, precisely whether it's for aging or for some, uh, you've had an accident, or situationally, you're driving, and you're, when you're driving your car, you're visually impaired in terms of operating your phone. You go from eyes on, fingers on, to mouth on, ears on. It adapts. Adaptation is the fundamental nature or notion of a measure of intelligence in a system that it lets you get on with your job in a way that's appropriate to the context. And, and those contexts are varied. And we can, we can follow on that, but I, I want to hear some response. You know, it's complexity, like accessibility is the solution, but it's more disability is the opportunity because it is a complex thing, disability, and it really slows it down where when we solve for it and then break it out in the macro sense, we can see smaller um, differences for people that might be impacted less but they can, they can use the, how they all blend into each other. And I, I like what Bill says about how it automatically adjusts and adapts 
but it does so unconsciously. And whether we're thinking creativity or in the flow, like we know when we're doing something we love, we're in passion, we're excited to do it. What takes us away from it is when we got to stop and think about the how. Whenever we can make the how fall into the back seat or to take a step back, it really allows us to focus on the why and the what that really brings technology, humanity, AI, input and output all together. And Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. So yeah, my name is Dave Dame. I'm currently in accessibility and I'm relatively new into accessibility. I've been in technology for over 30 plus years, but this is the first time I think I've kind of came to an age where I want to really leverage what technology can do to help other people like me achieve the life that I've had, hopefully with a lot less effort. That's right. Uh, Dave, I think one of the first times I saw you uh, was on a video that you did for Surface, and we were talking about accessibility technologies. And uh, you know, the first time I saw that video, we were in a room in the, uh, in the roadmap room for Surface, and I think it pretty much brought everyone to, to tears in a good way, not in a bad way, but in a good way. And, um, and, uh, and, it, and here I was thinking, here's a person who knows how to say things and have a unique point of view and present things that is impactful, uh, not for the accessibility community alone, but for everyone. And I remember when you were in my lab, you came over just, uh, I think a few months ago, and we were sitting just chatting and, uh, and we were talking about some of the profound technologies um, that have occurred that have had the most impact um, on even the accessibility community. And you had just a profound insight that you know, uh, was very educational for me. Do you wanna t tell, me, yeah. tell us a little bit about that? I remember when we were talking, you were like, you know, what is some of the best assistive technology that you've ever come across, you know, and you know, how sophisticated was it? And, we're, and I'm, like, I'm like, you know, the most best assistive technology that I still use today is cut, copy, paste. Cut, copy, paste really revolutionized uh, technology for me because think about when we mass produce text. It's not always easy for typing, even if you can naturally type, it's a low value activity, really redundant. So when you could cut, copy, paste, you were able to easily reproduce that in a simple keystroke so you could really do it naturally without redoing it because before there was technology, there was like a typewriter. If you screwed up, you had to retype the paper or if you wanted you know, to reuse some things. But when you could cut, copy, paste, that was a game changer where I was focusing less on how to reproduce the content, and more, what do I want to talk about? That's amazing. Uh, I, that is uh, such a profound insight there, uh, because you were telling me, you're educating me, how, how things like this um, are not just useful for anyone, but because it, it reduced repetitive tasks, physical tasks, that it was easy for uh, it was easy to do things like you're saying and avoid the, the the getting out of the flow of the task that you have at hand and more focused on what you needed to essentially do, which is a major theme of of uh, of today's video is how artificial intelligence will essentially change the way we interact with computers by turning things into a much more um, fuzzy interaction model in, in what I call the new mouse, but. We'll, we'll table that and get to that uh, later on in the video. I just wanted to stay on this topic a little bit. Uh, Bill, do you have any thoughts there? Yeah, um, first, um, Larry Kessler uh, worked at Xerox PARC, and he, that's where cop, cop, copy paste came from. And he's the one who introduced uh, Steve Jobs to, to Xerox PARC, and that's how it sort of got out into the broader world. Um, he passed away recently, but it's, it's an interesting thing that he never thought of it as an accessibility aid in, uh, in terms of the general, uh, in terms of specific populations, but rather for the general population. And I think that what brings the key point I wanna make, our society has, and humans have evolved throughout history by building accessibility aids, that is prosthetics that help compensate for our lack of ability to think, to move, sense, and to function as a society. 
And so every tool, every technology is a prosthetic. And now we can talk about classes and, and what they address and look at what are the repertoire of weaknesses that we can um, help uh, facilitate, enable, make seamless. And if you think back to that video, Stevie, I remember I brought the comment up we're all going to be disabled someday, just some of us beat you to it. <laughs> so in designing for people like me today, we're designing for everyone else in the future because our ability is always going to naturally decrease as we age. So how do we have flexible technology, a flexible way we can interact with it so we can stay on focus, be creative and be productive to really still be able to live the life to the fullest? That's right. That's an amazing point. Uh, what what uh, what projects um, do you see currently today that you know excite you that kind of demonstrate some of those ideas? Work in AI, right? I know everybody gets scared of AI because it can automatically do this and that, but it gets me excited because it's going to be able to really kind of create an environment where everything adapts for me automatically through multimodal things, whether it's the camera looking at me where I don't have to naturally reach and click something. Just like as, a, as humans, we can look at each other and just right. notice body language, different tones, different things. It really allows us to really have the environment, the, the weight of the environment and the how taken off of us so we can interact naturally like we always have been. And then really, everybody thinks that's not much of an effort, but if we really think about it, it does take a lot of concentration to think about all those little things. So when AI is coming in doing that without me invoking it, think about the camera. I don't have to invoke it. It's just going to recognize I do something and go, oh, Dave automatically wants that. And how could it help your life, Stevie? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that we're on, on this amazing progressive trend right now where we're slowly uh, using artificial intelligence as a tool to replace old classical functions that in some ways did an okay job, but had way more potential. Uh, simple examples like you just mentioned with the camera, you know, auto framing and digital pan tilt zoom now. Are, is becoming much more mainstay and will be available on pretty much every computer device. And what that allows you to do is not even think about are you in the frame of a camera? Can you move around um, you know, and, and have you communicate effectively through a computer as if you know, we were in the same room? So you know, this collaboration technologies um, uh, that I think you know, is one of the most important things that we do here at Microsoft, bringing people together so they can get work done, because ultimately that is how work gets done, is between people. And, and using digital technology to facilitate um, that interaction is one of the most powerful uh, solutions that we provide to the world. And to me, one of the most exciting things, and you see that transcending in pretty much almost every technology that we put out there with the cameras, with the microphones, with the pen, um, uh, with our basically tools that are inherently collaborative in themselves. Um, uh, Bill, what, do you, what are your thoughts there? So, you know, I, I like the, 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 the challenge of, of AI and intelligence systems that came out of what you two were just speaking about. The axiom that's on, been on my web page uh, for for years is uh, everything's best for something and worst for something else. And you know the 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 what, difference between a wise person and, and not a wise person is understanding the who, what, where, when, why, and how uh, on each side. You have to know the full 360 from the worst to the best before you commit to taking a technology, and then do your best to tilt the scales on the positive side. And that means you have to have some kind of moral compass, but the um, it's kind of like you look at the cameras. Well, sure, there's all kinds of issues about face recognition and surveillance and so on and so forth. Okay, we can put that on, on, on one side. On the other hand, I talked to my buddy, uh, Jenny Leigh Fleury, who's the, you know, the chief, chief accessibility officer of Microsoft. And, and, uh, and if I'm not looking at the camera, she'd say, Bill, I can't hear you. And, and, and I realized, oh, she can't read my lips. She can't see me. And without the camera, she can't participate. And, 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 
And it's just things like that, that we think about when we're putting the cameras on, we don't just think about um, the other aspects of it, but how does that impact um, people who are hearing impaired? And I, and I think that every tool um, has some impact on some one person or another, but with different disabilities, that means that people with different abilities need to attend the same meeting, have the same act, uh, participate fully, and yet have a different experience, one that's authentic to them, the resources they have, both human and technologically. And, and, and so that you get consistency of experience and quality of experience by being inconsistent on the delivery mechanism, but the delivery mechanism is appropriate. What technology does in the end is it brings humans together. Like, as humans, we can be all smart individually, but it's getting an opportunity like this to be able to collaborate with one of each other where we become multipliers. And if it wasn't for technology at this moment, we wouldn't be facilitating three people building off each other's ideas. And right. as much as technology can help, you know, do complex things and solve it, but sometimes it's just as simple as bringing humans together to really be able to multiply off of ideas, opinions, and differences of opinions that can really be powerful. That's right. And if you, uh, and the way technology has done this for many, many decades is, uh, uh, is they help us time shift and spatially shift our interactions. Um, so as an example, our recording here today, we're spatially shifted. Bill is in Toronto, but he's, he's here interacting with me and Dave. And, and it's time shifted because it's recorded and you at home or in your office are watching this in a different period. And pretty much every collaboration technology that we have uses one of these axes to essentially get work done. Um, you know, we either bring people together that are spatially shifted and so that they can get things done in real time or we time shift it and it's something that's recorded or done in a document at different time slices. Uh, and so that, that's kind of, a, I think, a really interesting or a very powerful, essentially, methodology that we've been using for, for quite some time. And if you think about it, pretty much almost all technology kind of falls in one of these buckets. Even music or movies are a form of, essentially, storytelling that's time shifted. I, I'm thinking back to um, the copy-paste, um, cut, copy-paste example. Um, it illustrates something that's fundamental to understanding the nature of what is an effective prosthesis and um, an accessibility aid, and that is it, the nature. What is the nature of skill? Now, but if I said what's the opposite of skill, most people are going to say unskilled, but that's not very helpful. But the actual definition that Stu Card and Tom Rand, two of my heroes, uh, told me was no, it's problem solving um, because you have to plan and you have to organize, and and that takes learning. And, and learning is a power function. So the thing about um, if you did a proofreader symbol, just circled and did a line, you'd get the, 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 the verb, the direct object, the indirect object of the, of the command through one single gesture. And therefore, it's one concept. And that's called aggregation, that you take the subtasks to get your, that you have to undertake to meet your objective, and you find a means of articulating them it's appropriate for the person that can do it in the least number of steps, hopefully one, and therefore you can work at the speed of thought and, and that you're not consuming any cognitive resources or any motor sensory resources in the articulation un unless it's for expression purpose. Like I can wave my arms to say, I really believe this, but, but to, to actually get to the point, I want to focus on the conversation. I want to be able to listen and I just want to get it out efficiently. And, and that's what we need to do at every level and, uh, and for every user uh, and every person in the world if we're going to meet our mission. Yeah, we were, uh, I think Bill and I, you, we were talking uh, last week actually about, uh, you know, an analogy about how lar AI models or large AI models can essentially help facilitate uh, the completion of tasks and how um, uh, instead of people worrying about the, the specific details that they have to worry about today, they can move their attention to much higher order bits. Um, you know, an, an analogy there would be, you know, you're trying to build a house. Well, you can be in charge of essentially 
everything part of the house, putting up the drywall, exactly where every specific electrical plug goes, uh, the wiring, what kind of color wiring to go get. Or you can be the architect and, and essentially sublet out a lot of these tasks to, uh, to other agents that are quite skilled and highly skilled at essentially understanding and completing those tasks. And you're orchestrating the, the big vision of this entire thing and not necessarily needing to worry about the very specific minute tasks. And, and if you take that analogy and let's say apply it to different applications that we have today, and you ask, how will that application change in the future with these powerful tools? Let's take, uh, let's take photo editing as an example. Today, with photo editing, um, you know, it is, it is a quite complex task. If you look at all the menus and the options and, and, uh, and the things that you can kind of do, highly multidimensional, highly illustrious with the amount of tools that you, you have to figure out and use. It'll take you years to essentially understand all the different depths and layers and tools and how to essentially apply them. But with large AI, you can be a little more implicit, less explicit, you know? Instead of twiddling every specific pixel, now you can say, oh, I like that picture of myself. Can you make me look a little younger? Can you please remove the, the shadows underneath my eyes? I'd like my, my eyes to be a little bit, a little bit more brown, um, you know? And essentially, you know, these are things I could have done with today's tools, um, but in the future, that brings a level of democratization that, and a level of essentially bringing up everyone's skill level up um, to, a different, to a different level where they, everyone can essentially do these sort of high level, beautiful, um, highly skilled tasks. Um, you know, what are your thoughts around, around on that? You know what, I have never seen that connection. The way you described it so beautifully, Stevie, um, because if I had to describe my disability, usually I'd be like cerebral palsy, blah, blah, blah. But you really broke it down to the nature. For me, I have to think about how I physically move my arm and hand. That's taking a lot of concentration. If I lift my foot, if I type, do I got to hold down the shift button? Do I need to do that? And when you did your analogy of building a house, that's what it's like to live with a uh, limitation because things that other people get to naturally take for granted is a task that takes cognition and compute time and memory. So now, this is where the good thing of synergy between accessibility, it's just great for everybody. Right. It might not be their disability they're challenged with, but I'm not a photo editing expert, I'm not this. But when you democratize all those little kind of specific nuances for everybody, it makes a very dynamic and fluid of high level way of thinking to get us above the little things as humans that holds us from behind. So AI really gives us the ability to really rise above the tasks and get across the goal, the objective, and the mission, which is really try to make our lives better in so many ways where we spend our life experiencing these things and not focusing on how to make these things happen. That was, that was, um, that was beautiful, Dave. I, I want to say something, but you don't have to, it doesn't have to be Go, recorded. go, go. So the thing is this, um, we can do better. And there's some techniques we can use to do better at achieving precisely what got you all excited. And that is anything we solution we think we're trying to support, break it down into all of the subtasks. So you've got this whole tree structure. And at every node in that subtree, say, how can I aggregate this subtree into one node that has the same complexity of any of the single nodes, but they've all collapsed into one and work it up. And by the way, for whom? And then you have to do it for every disability that you can think about situationally or, or cognitively or more essentially, and, and try and figure out these are the, that's the set of solutions I need, not the solution, because you'll never find a one size fits all solution. Now, once you do that, you can start to think about how to make things which are adaptive and accessible and across the board. And if you can build the tools underneath to actually have that happen so the developers don't have to think about all that stuff because the APIs just support it, then we're golden. Now, let me give you an example, because I have this notion that it's called the long nose of innovation. Anything that's going to happen in the next five years is already 15 to 30 years old. 
You just have to prospect for it. And the whole act of creativity is creativity is the act of making the obvious obvious before it's obvious. It's hidden in plain view. Take example, it before keyless entry, what did it take to get into your car and drive away? You had to go into your pocket, your purse, your briefcase, get the keys, pull them out, find the right key, shove it in, turn it, open the door, get inside, put it in the right, find the place if it's a rental car, turn it on and start. Okay, how many steps was that? That's the subtree. Now, with uh, with uh, simply with a key fob, you walk up, you open the door, you get in, push a button, and the car starts. Now, your car is a building. It is a house. It is an architecture. It is built, and it does have that one function that, get, that reduced all that complexity. And it didn't make you stupid. It meant you made it so you could keep talking instead of uh, up to your child or your spouse. Now, why is that different than me walking into my office and just turning my office on? I want a key fob for my office so that all of my devices come alive and I just and I just and because I've been introduced, they know the kinship and they know what their trust levels are. And we can start thinking about things like that going forward. Um, but we can think about that across all the tasks we do, break them down, find out how to do them in one in the least number of steps so you're freed to focus on your work. And this is technology, AI, that doesn't make you stupid. It makes you ever smarter. And that's the key thing. And um, you're not following turn by turn instructions by rote and going through the same area five times and never knowing where you are, even the sixth time. Well, even in the example you even in the example you gave, Bill, about how you can go in the room and it automatically does it, equal to is when you leave the room, it can shut everything down. Think about the environmental benefit we can start doing by using AI to really manage the things that we took for granted, right? When we're growing up, how many of us had a parent, turn that light off before you leave? Now we're starting to use AI to really manage the environment for better environmental things to really make this world a little bit more cleaner, waste a little bit less. And it's gonna be the sum of all those little things, like it is when we're doing tasks, that's gonna have the greatest outcome. That's not limited to just accessibility or disability, but just mankind in general and humanity. I mean, uh, I think uh, th it is absolutely progress it's progression and progress in our society, and we build on top of other things. We used to worry about where we would get our water, and we would carry our water from specific wells. <laughs> Today, water is automatically delivered to our house, same as electricity. And, you know, and, and I think AI um, uh, applied in this manner is no different. It is, it is taking very specific functions that we were doing before that we don't really need to worry about, and allowing us to focus our attention on what is even more important, which is, uh, which is you know, getting, getting work done, the task at hand, solving more complex problems. This is how we will solve the world's problems, by not worrying about the problems that we don't have to worry about, the, or the tasks, how we worry about the how, essentially. We can more specifically focus on the what. And just to, to be, uh keep on the notion of accessibility along different dimensions. I can go 400 miles north of where I am in Toronto and they don't have reliable electricity and they don't have clean water. And and so there's these other issues too that are, are always out there. So we really have to make sure that we are um, looking uh, worldwide, taking a global view because we're a global company. And that's, that's uh, and I'm not pointing fingers at all. I'm just saying we we really have to recognize the scope of the problem. And this is precisely why we need to free our minds up from trivial things that we should be able to take care of so we can focus on the really hard problems. And there's something we got to think about, Bill. You're from Toronto, so you experienced this recently too. A couple of weeks ago, one of our internet providers just went down. And literally, there was like no internet, no cell phone, no nothing. And I've gotten accustomed to having digital teams I have all this technology around me that gives me agency, independence, and safety. But what it reminded me of, today's innovation is tomorrow's essential services. So as we're building out AI, so well we should really think about what is the resilience needed? What is it, how do we make sure that we have systems to be able to 
be able to balance to imbalance because we think of these things as futuristic today. If we can do this, we can do that. But we got to remember, like we've learned in the past, these become essentially services. Right. So now we need to be responsible to ensure the resilience of those. That's right. Uh, extremely well said. I mean, uh, from the, the quote that pops in my mind from hearing both of you talk is from William Gibson. Uh, you know, the future is already here, just not evenly distributed. And um, that's, that's actually quite true. You see that everywhere, right? Um, some countries have, you know, highly available internet, highly available power, um, highly available computers and tools, um, and, and some, some, some parts of the world don't. But the hope is, as we globalize even more, and as we spread our technology more and solve even more complicated problems, that that will reach you know, to the farthest end of the earth to bring, to bring uh, everyone the tools that, um, uh, that are necessary in order to actually solve the world's hardest problems. And to tap into people we're not even tapping into yet that might have some insights and ideas that because of the lack of internet or lack of being able to connect to them, we're missing out on things that right are very profound that they could bring to our attention. That's Just right. like when I shared cut, copy, paste, there's something environmental, there's something around there that, because they're in a different environment, they have a different sense of for That's what right. it is. The world is only using half its brain. Exactly. If we were able to connect its entire brain, imagine what we can accomplish. Just imagine. Right. But it's all coming together, right? Like, you look at UWB, to plug in cables behind, it's not so easy for some of us, but to be able to naturally roll over and it automatically knows, I want to connect to the bigger screen to share or even switch between devices. If it does it unconsciously without the hard cables or having to manipulate it, just kind of like when Bill talked about the key versus the fob, we're starting to really unlock the intersections of different things that really allow us to reduce that cognitive load that we would usually have to find the cable, make sure it's the right one it plugs in, try to make sure you're not unplugging something else. It's such a, I mean, I, that, that's the thing I, when I, I, that I love talking to you, Dave, is that, that just that, I think to you it's, it's an obvious insight, but I think it's a profound insight for everyone. Simple things like, you know, advanced technology like UWB being so, so important not just to remove wires but to help people connect things of all abilities you know and not needing to worry about does this cable go to here and can i reach behind the computer and plug it in and you know do i have even the right cables um, around um, and um, are there other examples that i know i think we've talked about some things in the past where like well we talked about the camera right like when i started microsoft let's say i might have used other technology for a while but when i seen hello and I didn't have to log in, I could just look at my computer. Now you might think, okay, you were able to log in effortlessly. But think about the more complex passwords we have. If I gotta log in every time my computer times out, I get worried that's gonna time out, so I'll dive on the keyboard to quickly make sure. But now with Hello, I get the security of it locking when I'm nowhere near. And when I roll up and I can authenticate while I'm in thought, now I can begin capturing those ideas. Something so subtle as that. And I don't think it was ever made for assistive technology. It was just made for people that didn't want to type their password in either. But think about how intuitively it made it. That's right, exactly. It's such, it's such, a, it's such a powerful insight, you know, like, again, like, you know, removing those barriers that get in the way of flow and work. And, and, but at the same time, it didn't, uh, Windows Hello helped enable, you know, and helped enable security and remove the, the, uh, the, the repetitive physical task required always to get into your computer so you can just worry about what the thing you had to worry about. Exactly. And it's taking you, keeping you into flow, into thought, just like when we used to program, right? We used to hate that project manager would come are you almost done yet? Because it took us out of what we were doing. That's right. Maintaining flow, I think, is one of the design principles that 
you see um, us use in, in, in uh, completely integrated in our design flow, whether it's on Surface or Windows or, or our entire across END. Like, how can we essentially help the person maintain flow um, uh, and remove those barriers that seem um, unnecessary for the ultimate task at hand? And again, this is what excites me about artificial intelligence. Not only democratizing you know, high skill sets, but at the same time helping people essentially take what's in their mind, the high level thoughts, and turn them, into, turn them onto the page, onto the paper. Right. And there's still little ways AI can make things that we think are already solved better, like voice to text, right? We're, we're all using voice to text now. Back when I started using it in the early 90s, you had to talk like a robot for it to get it in. Now we can speak naturally, except there's still a gap. The way we write is different than the way we talk. That's right. So I'd love to see AI where I could dictate it and it would know I want it in written format and know how to automatically convert my verbal text into written text. That's right. Because right now I put a lot of cognitive load to think about, okay, I'm dictating this, so I got to speak in written speak. You think that's hard or easy, but it's really hard to do. And now today, with the technologies that we have, literally in front of us, we can take that even a step further. Not only can we take your natural spoken words and turn them into text, but we can essentially allow you to edit them directly and then regenerate the audio from that. Now, not only so, so basically taking you know, speech to text, edit, the order of the word, let's say you didn't like a specific word, and then use neural text to speech to regenerate the words, and then go even a step further with large AI models. Again, we can now morph the lips to essentially match to what the words are saying. So even the recorded video that was happening, like let's say you were recording a video, was happening can essentially now sync with the edits that you made offline. Or even better yet, we got to decide on the format before we start. Am I doing a video? Am I doing an audio recording? Or am I doing a uh, Word document or a type document? What if we just start talking and it automatically produced all those formats so as a user, if you want to watch the video, you can. If you want to listen to the audio, you can or if you want to read it, you can. That's brilliant. So no longer are we making that decision ahead of time. That's brilliant. We're just in the moment, and AI can automatically do those different formats for us. And, and not only that, not only that, not only can it produce all those formats potentially automatically, but it, it can apply the right techniques to make it sound the way it should for, through that medium. To optimize for that medium. Correct, correct. That would be sweet. Correct, so like you're typing. I mean, so it would be as if you wrote the paper, but it's slightly different than the way you would say it. Right. Right, it might be longer exactly. on the page, then, and it might be shorter and more to the point. Uh, on, on the video. Right, it's like when people right. go, I like the book better That's than right. the movie. That's right. What if the time came where we could Correct. take away that difference? It's just some people prefer written format over video. That's over, right. That's but right. think about it just automatically optimized per the medium. And then going even a step further, we can do it in all languages. Yes. And we can do the voice in all languages. We can do the written text in all languages. I mean, like, it's just so, so powerful. It so globalizes. Global, globalizes everything. That's right. What do you think, Bill? I've given a lot of talks where people re uh, recorded the video and then said, hey, could you just write it up for us? And here, we'll transcribe the talk for you. And stupidly, on a number of times, I tried to uh, edit the, uh, the transcription into an article, and I've learned... Uh, enough now to never do that uh, because it's easier to start from scratch uh, because we talk very differently for very good reasons. Uh, than exactly. We, write. we can take an entire written document and essentially create a summary abstract of it. Super powerful. Or we can go the other way around. We can take a bulleted list of ideas and turn it into a paper. Now, you know, some of you be like, oh, this is difficult. This is diff Why would you want to do that? That sounds fake. But in a lot of ways, it's, it's a tool. 
It's a tool to help you unblock. Sometimes you're stuck on the page. By the way, some people are really great writers and some people aren't. Some people would really appreciate the ability to actually help to essentially say, oh, get me unstuck. Let me hear, I know the, these are the thoughts I want to essentially communicate, but I can't get them down. But help me get, help me get going. And this is what these technology to me are for. Now, the, the knee-jerk reaction that often happens is what I think always happens to new, new technologies. This is dangerous. It can be abused. Um, uh, uh, you know, what about this? What about that? Absolutely, those are things to essentially worry about. Like we do today. With, like we do today. But, 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 but technology will be used to solve those technology problems. Cars, for example, <laughs> were very dangerous. They still are, but we still drive them. And we use technology to solve the problems that they created, right? Or, or they, enable somebody like me to be able to get around independently. Or get around independently, yeah. right? Cars killed people. People didn't wear seatbelts. Then seatbelts came. Then airbags came. Then traffic laws came. Governance came, essentially, around it. And, and those are all important barriers to essentially help. And you will absolutely see the same level of governance and technological solutions that will be applied in this situation. Simple example, deep fake videos. Okay, great. Maybe this is, this is an, a, an application of, uh, of, um, uh, um, uh, of NFTs. Maybe now a, a, every video that I generate that is for me, that should be authentic, should have an NFT on it. Now it's authentic. Now it's great. It's only one of a kind. People can't essentially generate. It's my NFT. For example, you know, so I, I, I feel like, like whatever the solution is, that there will be solutions that we will solve for. This is why, why I, love about, I love about our industry, I love about our, our society, is that you know, for every problem that's around the corner, we'll figure out a solution. And to bring up Bill's point too, is maybe some people prefer to do it in different mediums because they learn differently. That's right. It doesn't mean the technology will prohibit them from doing that. That's right. If you're still an avid learner, sure, and you get things by doing different formats, by all the means, continue to do that and keep doing that as well. But to your point, it's getting somebody that has trouble getting their ideas out. It's getting the people that struggle to have a voice for the ability to be heard in different ways and mediums to touch them in another way. I'll give you another example. I was, when I was an intern in 95, uh, I was in the uh, natural language group in, in office. And uh, I just finished reading a book on, uh, Ch from Chomsky, I think it was called Language. Um, I forgot the exact title. And yes, it was a profound book. It helped me understand you know, how important language is to thought and how it's intertwined. Um, and, and I was like, well, what about the spell checker in Word? It's going to destroy the English language. It's going to make me so lazy. I'm not going to learn how to spell anymore. And I wrote this long paper to Bill Gates. And, um, you know, and, and I was like, it's going to you know, mess things up. It's, you know, people aren't going to know how to talk in the future. Um, of course, that didn't happen. The point is, I think it, like we, we all grew up, we still learn how to write in school. But how many people with a pen? and piece of paper. But how many actually today we sit down uh, with a piece of paper and a pen and we write down our thoughts? Not as much as we used to. Not as much as we used to. We still do and it's still an important task and it's still important, as Bill, you were saying, for me to essentially think through a problem. But that's just one of the mechanisms in which people use to think through a problem. But even in evolution of it, right? Like, I used to like for my creativity, I used to like using a normal pen. But as you can tell, liquid paper probably isn't the most clean. But now we have digital pens. Right. So now it gives the forgiveness for me to be creative and an easy way for me to do it. It's not like back when it was pen and paper. That's right. Because it was absolute. You do it once, your editability wasn't there. But now you're combining a beautiful method like handwriting that gets my brain thinking in a different way when I'm mind mapping. That's right. With the forgiveness of digital where I can easily edit and create it. And it's kind of the evolution of writing That's right. and not just the writing itself. And, and actually, and what I'm, so digital ink is one of, the, one of the areas I'm really excited about with the application of large AI models. 
And it's exactly for, uh, for the reason you just pointed out. Just like the analogy of like going from, uh, from paper to digital, where it's a little more forgiving on digital, AI is going to make ink even more forgiving. Where, where it can take a messy handwriting like mine, or mine, or yours, yeah. and make it more legible. Where it can make me a better drawer by me trying to essentially fuzzily draw what a dog or a cat should look like, and it can guess what I'm trying to draw and help me complete the drawing. And it can translate it to text and other formats and even audio. So now, even though we made that explicit decision of where we wanted to start, right. now it's not restricted to that. That's right. And it can span across many different mediums. It's a great point. That's a great point. It's beautiful. Yeah. No, I was just curious. Um, Bill, we should ask Bill that. Yeah. Bill. Bill. Bill, I have a question. When we, st when we started this, Stevie asked me what Watch. my favorite what my favorite uh, technology was and stuff that I've seen come through that's enabled me. I would like to ask each of you, what is the most best technology that you've seen that's impacted your life in a profound way? I can say pretty confidently that it was when I first encountered, um, in particular digital, but also analog electronic musical instruments when I was an undergraduate in music school. And the reason was, all of a sudden, and this comes back to this notion of skill, if, if you're a composer and you want to hear your music fully orchestrated, you had to be beyond graduate school and have an orchestra. But as soon as I had synthesizers, and I, I built this computer music system where I could actually write, and I could write my music out and have it performed and, and orchestrate it and hear it, I could do that as an undergraduate. And 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 and, and or even at early later on, my kids could actually learn the difference about how the timbres change by on synthesizers, and that meant that they could start thinking about music problems at a much higher level than just how to the flying fingers on the keys for five years uh, before you can do anything, and it's not de-skilling. It just changes the level to which you can think about and therefore learn about and therefore make better judgments in terms of how you listen to music. And that freed me up completely. And that brought me totally into this space. That's why I worked on this stuff. It's just trying to make better musical instruments that I could take on stage as well as compose on. Bill, what, do you, what about the, the watches that you collect and, uh, and you know, the touch stuff? Like, the, like, what does that represent in your mind? Because, I, I mean, you have an amazing collection of historical gadgets that, in a lot of ways, are really impressive for their time. So, honest, I'm a collector, I'm not a hoarder. Um, all evidence to the contrary. So I have about 850 to 900 um, physical objects that represent the human interactions with machines. Um, some of them go back to the 1800s. Uh, they're not digital, but they, but they are harbingers of what came digitally. Um, but that includes remote controls, uh, game machines, accessibility, tools and so on, uh, key keyboards and mice. And the reason I have those is not, I collected them originally as reference objects on which I could learn to inform decisions and things I was designing at the time in my research. But at a certain point, I realized they were an incredible, it was an incredible archive that documents the nature of innovation and the nature of design and, and how things um, evolve. If you actually take the devices as the protagonists in kind of like a movie in these narratives and show the evolution of how thoughts that basically dispel the Edison myth about the great man theory of the inventor to simply the standing on the shoulders of giants. And so for any of us, the first thing we do is go prospecting for whose shoulders could I stand on to give me a, a lift to the problems I'm thinking about. And if I'm really successful and have a good career, the most I can hope for is to make my shoulders worthy for someone else standing on. I don't have to be an inventor. I, if that's enough, that's all we should hope for. And if you get that, you've made a contribution. And um, and 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 by the way, I can teach this process, and I can teach it by example, so that you don't have students thinking that they have to invent stuff, thinking that Johnny Ive or or Ralph Gruen or anybody or you Stevie or me um, invented this stuff on our own. None of us did it on our own. 
we chose our heroes well and we learned from the best and that's and that's how we whatever success we've had that's where it came from and and then you can still that by example now you know why you like them so much yeah so what is your favorite technology uh, um there are a couple but the one that really stands out to me is playtable and uh and why it was so powerful it was first early in my career 2000 2002 2003 uh, me and Andy Wilson, we wanted to work on a mixed reality table. We wanted to develop this notion of a computer that could spatially understand what was happening on top of it. Um, this was very early days. I mean, this was really even before a lot of touchscreen stuff started coming out. And we used computer vision to digitize physical objects and multi-touch that was happening on top of a screen. We drove down to Ikea, we bought a wooden table, we cut a hole in the center, we put a projection screen, put a projector, and we put a camera, and, uh, and uh, we, uh, we created this interaction modality. First, that was social because it allowed multiple people to gather around the table rather than, than, than in front of a computer. So it was collaborative, it was facilitating human interaction. And, um, and it was multimodal, uh, which because we were using gestures, multiple hands, physical objects to, to write on the screen and tags um, to essentially interact with the digital world. And this was like one of the first, in my opinion, one of the first mixed reality um, um, uh, sort of ventures that we, we undertook. And it, it influenced how I think about computers and, hum and HCI technologies for my entire life this multimodal nature and the fact that the more context you bring into the picture, the better you can compute on the individual's behalf. Um, the more easier you can make it for that person to complete their task. And ultimately in the end, computers are there to just link you with someone else. And that led us to a lot of the work that we have, we're still do today around collaboration technologies. We call it the magic window, uh, which you're seeing it making its way in our products. Uh, you know, the, the digital pan tilt zoom, the auto framing, um, the, the better voice, uh, the eye contact adjustments, the pose adjustments, the head tilt adjustments. You know, these things to essentially make the interactions with other people through a computer all that more natural as if the two people are in the room together. That, you know, is a, is a North Star. It's a dream to essentially do that. It's almost a teleportation device, but not really. Um, you know, and so that that one is uh, to me uh, has been one of the most profound um, uh, things that I think has caused a lot of work and still is causing me a lot of work to essentially fulfill all those dreams. And 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 I think that's that's really exciting. And I think large AI models will help me complete will help complete some of that vision. Because of that. But there's a really important thing about that table that I want to because you did mention it, and I want to give you full credit and St and, and, and 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 Andy. The minute you had it horizontal, even if there's a little bit of a tilt, you have a bottom of the screen and a top of the screen and the sides. The minute it's horizontal, all game bets are off because there's no bottom, there's no top. You can sit okay. all the way around. Okay. And so you can't have icons down on the base and on the left side, the right side. You're, you're, where, what, where's the baseline for the fonts when you have text and documents and so on and so forth? And all of this stuff changes. It changes things dramatically. And, and so right off the bat, you can say, if we want to build user interfaces that can adapt into the context, that means also the posture of the display, when it's flat, whether it's on the wall vertically, or whether it's um, you know sort of at a drafting table angle. And, and, and so and if you haven't enumerated the design space by finding these sweet spots that nobody's tried before, you're not going to realize, oh my God, we're going to invest in all this stuff. We're going to hit a brick wall because none of our stuff can expand to that. And if we had have played with now with the experience of that, now 20 years almost, that's probably 18 or 17 years since, since you did that work, um, we've been able to internalize what the demands are and we start to incorporate it into the thinking today so that we can futurize our products as to move forward into that direction. It's it's really really fascinating, and that's where the research happens, and it takes a long time. That's that's so that's so true. So uh, one of the one I think one of the more uh, uh, important papers I wrote uh, earlier on in my career was 
Um, so Bill, Bill Gates used to have these things called Think Week, and he would go off to some cabin and basically read a whole bunch of papers that were curated from, from the company. And um, I wrote this paper, I dubbed it Surface Computing, and it was basically at the, at the tales of the birth of, of Playtable, which later became Surface Table. And it was this idea, this notion, Bill, that you're talking about, which is, you know, uh, event, the idea of surface, first surface computing was all surfaces, tables, walls, even floors, would become intelligent and interactive. And we would need um, uh, essentially a, a, a language um, and an interaction modality to make that essentially all work. And it wasn't going to be taking a desktop computer or desktop PC and applying it to the wall, as you can see. And, and that work eventually you know, became what you see today in Surface Hub. You know, in Surface Hub, if you put, if you put the close button on the upper right-hand corner, like you would on a desktop, guess how many people can reach it? Just you. Yeah, <laughs> just me, right? No, no, you need a really big stylus, which is also a pogo stick, so you can That's bounce right, on exactly. it. So, you know, so, so, so how you approach design for these different competing form factors are really, really important um, um, as well. Now, let me tell you about another, the other one that was so important. This was in grad school. The other one that had a tremendous influence on me in terms of interaction, um, uh, uh, human computer interaction, was the Mothmobile. And, and what this was, was I wanted, and the reason why uh, is I wanted, I wanted to build, I was so excited about robots, because uh, robots had an ability to um, uh, interact with the world and manipulate the world and vice versa. Robots were also highly multidisciplinary. They were mechanical in nature, they were electrical in nature, and they were sensor-oriented in nature. They had to consume the world, understand the world, and also interact with the world. And that was really exciting to me. So I, had, I did a whole bunch of robotic stuff when I was, uh, I was younger. But, but at the time, uh, algorithms and our techniques were very archaic, very nascent. And so I had the idea, the inspiration, if a little insect can basically maneuver and interact the world, I can't come close to its ability to do that. Why not steal its ability and use it in my system? And so I took a Manduka sexta, which is the world's fastest insect, it's a hawk moth, and I used electrodes to sense its intent. It's uh, essentially that I gathered from its flight muscles, evoked action potentials, electrical signals that the moth itself generates while it tries to do an activity. And I used that as the control signal for the car. And in a lot of ways, it was the exoskeleton for the moth as one way of viewing it, or the other way around, it was a hybrid robot that used a real live neural network to essentially, um, as its algorithm, as its control system, as its onboard camera, as its onboard fuel, as its, as its, uh, as its ability to essentially uh, maneuver and, uh, and interact with the world. That project helped me go into more was more into biology, more into neuroscience, which later on in my career here is all that more important as you try to design interaction technologies for people, the more you understand about that human and, and how they think and what they need to do, the better you can make that interface and that interaction. And I also learned that in the end, what matters is the intent, not necessarily the direct action. And if, if we can design technology, and again, it's going to be a combination of hardware, software, and AI. If we can design technology to get at that intent, that is the ultimate in HCI, in, in human computer interfaces. Well, and the funny thing is, is we always see technology and humanity on, compete, on a competing axis. Right. But really, I see technology being an enablement for further humanity that we've been limited to without the technology. That's right. So I don't think no longer they're competing on the same access. They're really trying to enable them leapfrog each other as we try to push new limits. That's right. That, that was beautifully said. And again, I think, I mean, I think just to kind of close the loop on where we started, you know, these sort of innovations, how, how, um, you know, how we can design proper HCI interface technologies, if we do it right, they're applicable for everyone. 
and we make it easier for everyone of all abilities. And, um, and I think that's, that's what so far, just like your simple example of cut, copy, paste. You know, and, and, and I think the dream would be for us to figure out what's the next cut, copy, paste um, innovation here. In a macro sense. In a macro world. sense, that's right. So the, the quick um, thing that ties some of this together, there's a hero of mine named Melvin Kranzberg, and it's a historian of technology, and he has a couple of seven laws. In fact, I'll mention two. His first law is technology is not good, it's not bad, but nor is it neutral. It will be some combination of the two. And the second law is kind of poetic. Um, instead of um, necessity is the mother of invention, his second law is invention is the mother of necessity. Because of the first law, you will get some things wrong, and therefore you own the, and have the nece necessarily you have to uh, fix what you broke. Now, your example, I thought you gave a really good uh, response to my provocation. Um, NFTs were an example of what I had in my mind that would be a way to address uh, technologically, um, the issue about deep fakes and so on and so forth. Um, that's one. And I think that keeping Kranzberg's laws in mind and the point, my meta point is, is was mainly not to be negative, but a, my job is to be a skeptimist, half skeptic and half optimist, and keep that balance and, and ask the questions at the beginning. And so what's neat is you, right off the bat, you came up with that solution at the same time you're thinking about the uh, that that way to address the dark side while you're um, advocating for the positive side and so you develop those things in parallel and and have those thoughts and that's all we that's the best we can do because we will never get it right uh, uh, completely right but we have to find uh, the 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 best balance and uh, instead of just running off and saying the first idea hey let's just do this what, what could go wrong we'll fix it if it breaks no that's that's proven not to be a good solution and um, and I, I think that um, that's the best we can do. The thing about thinking and writing, I think that it's all, it's really, really interesting because a lot of how we think when we're writing is drawing pictures and diagrams at the same time we're writing words to be able to, because we're really trying to, at the meta level, develop relationships. But all this, I think, comes back to the whole notion of flow that you were talking about, Stevie. And, and, and I think that's the whole thing. It's 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 not about interface design, it's out of your face design. How do I get all of this stuff out of the face so I can go f flow and maintain flow, not have speed bumps that slow me down, and I can capture thoughts and communications um, in the most seamless and effective way possible. And one way to think about that, and I think we've had this conversation before, is to redefine even what we think about when we talk about mobile computing. Mobility, mobile is not a device, it's not a gadget. It's mobility of the human activity, working within the company of human and following and supported um, as you move through the eco technological ecosystem and the physical ecosystem of the world around us. And when we can achieve that, because there's different activities we do in different places and we move from place to place as the activities change because at the high level, they chunk together and, and have relationships. And that's what we designed for. And that's why designing for the office or the house or the, the, the city planning um, or the world ecology, all of those things are just embedded like an onion and we can't deal with them all. But the critical thing is this, they're deep, serious, hard problems. They require huge depth and the dirty little secret of highly accomplished people is what they've had to neglect in order to become highly accomplished. And therefore to have the breadth that the problems require, you need a cluster, a collection, a team of deep thinkers in different disciplines, but where the combined base of their expertise covers the breadth of the problem. And that comes back to my notion. There never was a Renaissance man or woman. Uh, otherwise, Leonardo and Michelangelo, why did they need the Medici to fund them? They should have done their own banking. So, but what we can do is we can have Renaissance teams so that collectively, with mutual respect for each other's expertise and a common ground of understanding of the framing of the problems in our language so respect each other, we can work in concert, just like an orchestra, and we can address these problems. And I would say that the most fundamental thing we can do collectively is who has the, do we have the expertise for the problems we're trying to address? What are those, what is that expertise and where do we find it and how do we work together? You do that, the problems have solved. And and um, and I'd say that the this conversation reflects that because the three of us have very very different backgrounds, which is why um, 
it, it it's 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 far more interesting. And by the way, if AI can be a third, a fourth party there to enter that conversation, to give alternative ideas and alternative perspectives, God bless it, because that's what we need. And and I know that I'm way smarter with other people around than by myself. I'm just average on my own. And 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 if AI can augment me when I am alone, thank God. That that's that's great because I I need that thing to bounce ideas and to have other opinions expressed. And so there's 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 a positive future potentially if we do it right. And I think adding another attribute to your point, Bill, is ethics. Right? Get somebody that's thinking about the ethics. Just because we can build it, should we? What do we need to think about? And it might be a lagger, like you said. We put it in place, then we put governance afterwards to try to augment what we miss. But I think it used to be a big lapse of time between we come up with technology and then figure out how to govern it. It would lack for a while. Like when the internet came out, okay, now we need to govern and do things to, right. to get it going. But I think the speed between innovation and responsibility and ethics and the way we control those newfound innovations to become critical services, that time is going quicker and quicker because if we can use things like AI that can bring these multiple dimensional things together in a quicker way, we can be more aggressive because we've reduced that lagging time before we adapt it. Yeah, um, I, and, and just to just to kind of emphasize, Bill. I mean, the, the the idea of the Renaissance and the multidisciplinary thinking that is that is actually one of the core inspirations to the Applied Sciences Group. I mean, that's exactly how uh, we try to model ourselves. And and the reason is is you know the best product making we've ever done in the company um, is all about managing complexity and moving complexity around and making trade offs at the most highest level. Um, and, and in the end of the day, product design is about making the right trade-offs because nothing is ever essentially perfect in an absolute sense. It's just perfect in the relative sense of what you have essentially at hand. And, and, uh, and this is one of the things I love on how, how we build our products uh, here in E&D um, is we, we are able to look at things more globally, more holistically. And because we have skill sets and very different fields, all the way from you know uh, from ethics to uh, you know to accessibility to HCI design to design itself um, to the fundamental basic sciences, even in chemistry and um, and physics, um, as as well as all the engineering disciplines, we have mobility to move the the problem around so we can optimize the entire solution. Um, and, uh, and, and ultimately, you know, as a product designer, and I think all of us here are product designers, um, you know, when we look at a product on the market, we know fundamentally that that, was, that product went through that process, through that holistic thinking, and the right trade-offs were made um, you know, uh, more holistically, and it wasn't just the singular dimension um, that sometimes you see us out there. And how we can evolve, I think, is like you said, we're very specialty, good in what we do. We gotta almost remember, we gotta get comfortable at being uncomfortable. And sometimes, don't let perfection get in our way of getting into something new and different and imperfect in order for us to push that boundary. That's right. That perfection holds us back. Like, there is no more beautiful thing in the world as when we learn something new by making some kind of new mistakes or some imperfections because it moves from what we thought to a little bit further because we get rid of that thing that has to be glass perfect. That's so well said, so well said. Voltaire said uh, perfection is the enemy of the good. And, uh, and I, I think that the only thing uh, that I would say is there's a saying that's prevalent which I um, have makes my hair stand on end, and that's uh, fail early, fail often. And I think it's much better to have the positive spin, which is far more productive. That is learn early, learn often. 
um, because that's not accident. That's not thoughtless failure. It's actually intentional failure. That's what science and research is all about. Is you have a hypothesis, you test it, and if it comes off negative, that's not failure. That means that you learn something um, bec at, uh, about a very difficult question, and it directs you to what to do next. And what that really points to, Bill, and and I, and I, I think we can close the talk here is is it's really the call to action. Um, especially in regards to human interface design, um, is, is, is that be bold, think holistically, apply different tools. The solution isn't going to be in any singular uh, modality. It's going to be multimodal. It's not going, the solution isn't going to be in any specific device. It's about the system, the ecology, as we mentioned. We can only move forward if we're willing to fall back. And, uh, and, and with that, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thank you so much um, for, for dialing in, Bill. Again, you, you, um, even after this meeting, you're still two of my favorite people. So that was great. Uh, and Good thing. <laughs> I thought it would have scared you away. You know, uh, but absolutely, no, you're, 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 you're absolutely beautiful people. Thank you so much for being, uh, for being part of, of how we do uh, things here at Microsoft. Thank you. You're, you're both an inspiration. Thank you so much.